Welcome and thank you for coming to our second evening um, dedicated to a uh, week of uh, community resilience in Hartford. Um, if you want to know we got schedules back there, but tonight we have two workshops starting with Kathy Geigers. And we're uh, pleased to have her here. Just a couple housekeeping items. If you're not familiar with the building, there's obviously a water fountain just outside the door here. And the washroom is if you go out the store and take a right. And the men's room is on the uh, down the hall to the left, and the women's is on the right. So again, my name is um, Dylan, and I am the current chair of the Community Resilience Organization of Hartford. Um, um, the team, uh, together with uh, a lot of the other help from uh, leaders in the community, helped to organize this week. Um, and again, if you're not familiar you with guys the schedule. The best job in the Upper yeah. Valley. Uh, Matt Warren is also on the um, committee, as well as uh, Kai Cochran here, um, and then Jonathan Bowden, and uh, Laura Simon, and Simon Dennis is actually our representative in the select board, so um, it's a great, uh, diverse group of folks with a lot of experience in organizing, so we're happy to have them. Um, but tonight, we are um, pleased to have uh, Kathy Guy here to share her knowledge. Um, her work workshop tonight is obviously Weather, Climate, and Resilience, um, Memories of Irene. Um, so I'm just going to, we kind of did a uh, course description in bio, so I'm just going to kind of read that to the folks to give you overview. When Tropical Storm Irene hit in August 2011, Kathy Guy was able to make an immediate and clear connection between changes in the polar regions and development of the intense weather patterns that directly impact our community. Uh, Kathy will discuss resilience in an age of weather and climate transitions. Kathy is also a resident of, Hart of West Hartford and as a scientist has been collecting and analyzing data from patterns of sea ice for over 30 years. So she has the knowledge of that. Um, with that. Thank you. And I'm, I'm going to sit because then it's easier to see things so I don't show up like a big, you know, funny map. Um, so to, to move right along, I'm going to cover, try to cover six points. I'm hoping there's room for the sixth one, which is discussion. Um, and, and I'm trying to cover also a showing of the Irene film, which came out in 2013, thanks to uh, Vermont Institute of Natural Science collaborating with myself at Delaware and Peter Melson and Theo Jagar. So, um, but before we get into the film, I want to get you some background because the main point of my part here is to be the motivator and the prep rally instigator so that when Alan and Steve show up to do the energy workshop, you guys are motivated. So I'm the, I'm the warm up crew here. So I'm going to cover three topics for you from a scientific perspective, but I'm also wondering as feedback, I'm trying to work on how do we as scientists communicate better with everybody and at the same level? So that's my <coughs> agenda, if you will. But um, really, I'm just going to cover the three points of weather and climate. You know, what is this stuff in a nutshell? Based on what we know today, what is an executive summary of the conditions? And then what really is the underlying problem and what I have found personally as a very good resilience solution? I'd like to share that solution with you because I think that's something we can all leverage at the local level. So with that, I wanted to start out with the fact that um, weather and climate. Basically, we're on a rotating planet. As the planet rotates, it pulls the atmosphere with it, and that's what creates the whirls and swirls that make the weather. And so um, just from basic atmospheric dynamics, the weather itself, if you think of that as the whirls, the storms go around, you know, low pressure goes like this, so it swirls like this. So they're small scale, they're really frequent, they happen all the time, just this past week we had something to through. Um, but climate is this steady thing, or at least it used to be this steady thing. And now there's a couple of other big pieces that are connecting these two together. People used to say weather and climate don't mix. No, they don't usually because they're too far apart. But when we're in a state of transition like we are now, there are two connectors that start to develop. The first are the monster storms. And we're going to look at that a little bit. You've seen them, Sandy, OK? Um, Haiyan, the, the, the big one off of Mexico, the big one this year off of um, 
of Hong Kong. These are, you know, category five ginormous things. What do they look like in space? You know, from here, which just looks like a mess, but what does it look like from space? And that's, it's the monster storms combining with the climate that are creating the climate transition. Because, as I'll explain shortly, the monster storms reach out across <coughs> at the planetary scale. They're not just confined to like, you know, along the coast of the United States or something. So the most important thing is these all connect, they all interact, and they are going across time and space. So it's starting to sound like science fiction and Star Trek, but that's really at the level we're at. So I want to just start by showing you what it looks like to look at the whirls and swirls. I want to identify, right, this is the North Pole. So we're going to start at the North Pole because it's easier to see. The stuff in red is the jet stream, and then you'll see the whirls, and you'll see the waves. And I want you to notice how the waves are the jet stream going around, and how it is turning. Oh, good, it's working out pretty good with the light. And you can see that as the waves get more wavy, you get whirls. And that's how the storms are generated. And the steeper the wave, the harder the whirls. So if climate starts getting so that the, the poles get too warm, it gets, the waves get wavier, and that's how the storms get bigger. So I'm going to show you that just one more time again, just to get that sense. And so that you can see that when the waves are steady, the whirls are small, but the, when the waves are wavy, the whirls are bigger. And that's how and why the storms are getting bigger in this day and age. And this is mainly the, just working on the the, the jet stream we're used to thinking of, the one that makes the winter come through and they talk about in the winter time. But you can see when it's really steep, when the waves are really steep, it gets really wavy, the waves make the whirls, that's how we're getting those intense storms. I, I, I imagine that that was a, uh, a particular time when that was uh, that's a simulated. Oh. That's a simulated NASA thing. The big thing is, in terms of what's the bottom line, is that we've got what we always think of this jet stream is actually the mid-latitude jet stream. It's what separates the poles from the temperate region <coughs> where we all live. But there's another jet stream called the subtropical jet stream, and that's the one where off the coast of Africa you get the spawns coming across from the, um, that they usually come across about here, and they come between these, and that's what you get the, because there's a counter wind that goes the other way. The thing that's happening with the climate transition is the poles are warming faster than everything else. So the mid-latitude jet stream is getting wavier. And not only that, it's going deeper. And at the same time, the equator is getting warmer, and it's pushing up. So what's happening? We're going from a pole temperate zone tropical system to the collapse of the temperate zone. And that is disturbing. That's why it's distressing climate change. Because if the pole gets warmer, it's going to start moving down. And the tropics get warmer, they're going to start moving up. There's no reason for them to stop interacting. When you have strong forces, then they push apart, you get strong gradients, and you get a strong temperate zone that we're used to. If it gets too warm at the top and, and, and the bottom doesn't keep up with it, it's going to merge. We're going to lose that temperate zone, and it's going to go hot, cold, hot, cold. Have you noticed that a little lately? Mm -hmm. Last week, this week, okay, case in point, we're, we're feeling it. So in the context of how big these things are, I want to show you, this is from NASA, thanks to Ghost. This is Irene, and you remember, Irene was a quite a difficult storm here, but it's a, it was a normal size storm. This is a normal hurricane size that comes up. This is the coast of the United States. You can sort of see Florida. This is South America. Sandy, I don't know how many of you have ever seen the full scale of it, but Sandy, this is Florida, there's Cuba. Sandy stretched all the way across and was pulling across the entire <laughs> Atlantic. And it was pulling all the way up to Greenland. So it was a monster storm because it wasn't confined. It was pulling along and across the waves and pulling all that energy, that enormous cross-planetary energy, right onto the Jersey Shore. So when it hit, it hit with a punch. And that's very worrisome, because that means the planet is organizing at a very large scale to try to get rid of all this heat. 
And that's where we're going to get in trouble from the infrastructure perspective. But the good news, where are you all living? Don't sell your houses. Because <laughs> if you look, this is, again, a polar perspective. And, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to introduce this local to polar connection is the fact that this is the North Pole, right about where that A is. It's the North Pole. Uh, this is Alaska. We're looking down from the top of the planet. This is Russia. We're looking at Nor uh, Norway as well. The oil is being drilled in Russia. This is Greenland. This is the circulation of the ocean. Where is it all going? It's going in a circle here, and then it's heading out and going around Greenland, which is the big ice cap. Where is all that cool water going first in the northern hemisphere? It's going first, and I'm going to zoom this in. This little thing is the tip of Greenland. I kind of turned it a little bit. This is the tip of Greenland. This is the West Greenland current that comes on the Labrador current, and then you start getting really familiar because there's the Gulf Stream, there's the Canadian Maritimes, and there we are, right in here. So all the cool, all the icebox cooling system that's in the north comes to the Canadian Maritimes and New England first. And so it's going to be, we're going to be the place that's anomalously cooler than everyone else. When everybody else is heating up, we will heat up last. We'll also have water longer because we'll have the moisture left and the cooling capacity for the, for the water systems. So this is going to be one of the last places where the cooling effect of the ice sheet is going to reach in the northern hemisphere. That means stay where you are. You're in good hands. So in, that's really it in a nutshell as to what the large scale weather is about. And the next thing I want to get into is what are the existing planetary conditions? What are they from a high level perspective? Because that will help motivate us for what we do at the local level will make a difference at the global level because every little footprint will count. And the most important thing is we live on a planet that's just the right temperature. We live on a planet and to do that, you need all three phases of water. You need the, the vapor in the atmosphere, you need the liquid water in the streams and the ocean, and you need the ice. And the reason why that works is even from the point of physics, you know, there's the sun, there's Jupiter, and there's only a tiny little space. It's something called one astronomical unit. That's the, distance, the average distance from the sun to the Earth. That's 1.0. If you deviate, like go 5% closer, or you go 1 point, you know, 37% further away. That's all the space that you can put a planet in this solar system where the temperature is going to be in what physicists call the Goldilocks principle, the habitable zone. There is no other planet where the temperature is okay for us to live in. So this is the Garden of Eden. The whole planet is the Garden of Eden. It does exist. We're on it and we're in charge. We are the stewards who take care of this. There isn't any other real estate out there that we're going to get to. So, and there's, we're on a limited planet with a limited amount of resources and there's a lot of us. So the temperature conditions are very important. Again, the three key things solid, liquid, and gas states of water. If you don't have all three, you can't maintain the temperature. And so, in terms of what's the bottom line, we have to adapt to a changing climate so that we make it less severe. It's going to happen. There's nothing we can do about it. Our ancestors have been helping us do this since the start of the Industrial Revolution. We are already the generation. It's not our grandchildren. We are already the generation that has to start making the change to make it less severe. The second step is more difficult. Getting nations to do something about it. And I think at the local level, we're too small. But if each of us starts acting like a drop of water to make the ripples grow, we could set up prototypes to demonstrate this is what we can do at a little tiny level. Do you want to try it? Sure, I'll show you how to do it. I'll, I'll teach you how to do it. So that's going to be the tricky part. I don't think I know how to do that at the big scale, but 
maybe Hartford could work on it together. Because see, the really big problem is we as human beings have overshot our abilities. It really turns out to the Ice Age. 1300s to 1850 was called the Little Ice Age. That terrified humanity so bad that we started investing trillions of dollars from that time to now to figure out how does the planet stay warm, how does it heat, how does our industrial revolution work, how do we stay warm, we don't want to be cold, right? At the basic level, we don't want to be cold. Winter in, in Hartford, right? We don't want to be cold, get that fire going. We are so terrified of freezing to death that we have worked on heating and staying warm. And because of that fear, that's an innate fear that we're trying to compensate against. But we've been so effective at it with our heating systems, with our power plants, with our energy systems, that we now need to figure out how are we going to stop melting that much ice. And I wish I had come up with these words. They're great words. I love them. But I'm directly quoting an extremely fine gentleman who I've had the honor of working with. Um, not super close, because he's a god in my world. but. Um, this fellow is actually, I believe, older than everyone in the room, and I know there are some very elite noble gray hairs here tonight. Walter Monk was born in 1917. Anybody want to, do I hear a second for older? Wow. Okay, 1917, he said these words. In fact, he said them on April 25th at the University of Delaware when I was attending. He is quite one of those smart, 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 smart guys in the world. Um, he was a young student under Harold Svedrup, Svedrup, who was trying to figure out, and he, they had to figure out, those two had to figure out the tides and the currents to land the boats on Omaha Bay for Normandy. And he said it was the most exciting three and a half years of his life because everybody then, talk about resilience, he learned resilience that in those three and a half years. How effective we as human beings can be when we get together to solve a problem. In three and a half years, they had to figure out the tides and the currents for the very first time in human history so they could land on the beach to get in. The weather was terrible that day, but they had the tides and the currents figured out to minimize losses. So he did that. He figured out the waters of the Bikini Atolls. If you want to really look into some real life science fiction, just Wikipedia this guy's name. He's what's called a Jason. It's somebody who's selected within the United States government to serve as a national intellectual elite. There are very few of them. You get tapped. This guy is like way up there. But he's a real sweetheart when you talk to him. He's got this lovely Austrian accent, and he's just so sweet. But anyways, he figured out the wind-driven circulations. He's the one who really put out the first models, that, the first you know, mechanical models that gave the tides and made the tides work at Scripps. So for him to say that, as a lifelong, he still holds the position of Secretary of the Navy at Scripps Chair. <coughs> so this is a guy, he's, 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 he's not a liberal loose goose. He's a very smart, intelligent person that the Navy has relied on since D-Day. And he's still going. <laughs> Three years before D-Day. <laughs> basically. So, so, so basically, um, for him to say this means we're not talking about rhetoric, we're not talking about politics, we're not talking about financial issues. We're talking about a gentleman who has spent his life in service to the nation, and he really knows his stuff, and he's working with the top minds in the world, and he's saying this, we have to do something about not melting so much ice. So with that, I wanted to go into a little explanation of what does he mean by we have to stop melting, how much ice is he talking about, and how do we measure it. And basically, the real trick is with the ice. The ice is the air conditioner of the planet. Ice houses used to work really well years ago. Why is that? Because it's a lot of energy. This is where I get my pitch for the Energy Commission. It is a lot of energy to turn ice into water or water into ice. You know when those snow banks are out there and it's still April and they're still melting and it's, an, it's taken a while for that ice to melt. <clears throat> How much energy is there? If you take a piece of ice and you take a, the same amount in water and you try to melt the ice, it'll take 80 units of energy to, 
take that water into ice or that ice into water, that it takes to increase the water one degree centigrade, not Fahrenheit. That's 144 degrees Fahrenheit. So 80 times more energy to convert water to ice and ice to water without changing temperature. It takes a lot of energy to change state. To go from liquid to solid it takes a lot of energy because you've got to work the bond angles of the molecules themselves. It only has to move four degrees. The bond angle is going to move four degrees like this. And you go from water to ice. Because it's at the molecular level, it's almost approaching the atomic level. That phase change takes an enormous amount of energy. And if you think of that in terms of a, a temperature scale, it's like, you know, zero centigrade is, is the water turning into liquid and 100 is boiling. 80% of the weight of boiling is how much energy it takes to turn water into ice and ice into water without changing temperature. That is an enormous way to keep something stable, keep its temperature stable. And in terms of how much energy it is as a reference, a cubic meter is like three by three by three feet, you know, sort of like the old air conditioners. And that fact is an excellent reference because the old big boxy air conditioners before these modern heat pumps were about a meter cubed, three feet by three feet by three feet. They used 3,000, uh, that much ice has, requires 3, 300,000 BTUs of energy to melt or take that much water and turn it into a block of ice. That's the same amount of energy. If you look at the BTU capacity in your furnaces at home, I ask you to do that for homework. It's around 300,000 BTU. So an air conditioner in your home or a heating, a heat, a heat pump or a furnace is about 300,000 BTU capacity. That's how much capacity of energy it has. So does a cubic meter of ice. So every time you hear about so much ice being melted, think of every cubic meter of ice as an air conditioner for one house. That's how, many, how, much energy of, how much energy we're losing each time we melt ice somewhere. So the really good news, though, is I get to be a sea ice person and not a glacial person. Because this is a picture of I'm going to get the little mouse up. There we go. This is how much the ice is melted and projected to melt all the way to 2080. But these little blue things that are jumping up are little experiments to say, if you take away the ice, it all melts away in one summer. It actually comes back in two to three, two to five years. So the sea ice that's floating, that's why people are studying the sea ice. If the glaciers go away, it's going to be hundreds of thousands of years before the snow builds up slowly to get it back again. But the sea ice, it's thin layer of ice floating on top of the ocean. As soon as the planet gets into another state, this, or any state, the sea ice will tell you what the capacity is. It's like a thermostat, and that's why we're studying it. What is the capacity of the planet to retain that type of ice? And it recovers in a couple of years two to five years. And you can see, if you take away all the ice in the simulation, boop, it comes back at any, any level, at any level of whatever the ice used to be. If there's a whole bunch of it and it's gone for a year, it'll come back in a couple of years. Very resilient stuff. Very energy efficient. It's a renewable cooling source. And it's free. We just have to be careful of how we're heating the planet. So I find that how, very... How does it come back? It, well, the temperature drops and it grows. That easy. It needs energy to do that. You've got to cool it down. But once you cool it down, it'll store it in the winter and it'll release it in the summer. And if we lose the ice, then it's going to take a lot more energy to make it and it's going to take a lot more energy. Um, and then if we don't grow enough, then we lose it quicker. And then we no longer have that air conditioner at the poles during the summer. And instead, we have a hot ocean at the top instead of an ice box to keep it. And with 24 hours of daylight, it makes a difference. So, so what is the underlying source of the problem? And how do we stay positive and go forward with a resilient solution? And for that, I'm going to get my little blackboard out again. 
If you've ever been in one of those professor lectures where he pulls out or she pulls out the famous, it can be shown that, right? And then they just block the answer. Well, this is one of the ones I'm going to pull on you. It can be shown that 99% of human problems are man-made. And I challenge you all to go and to prove me wrong because I'm really pretty convinced on this one. Because in the end, the problem isn't a science problem. It's not a technology problem. It's, it's a will of the minds and the spirits of the people. We've made this problem. We can solve this problem. If we are the ones responsible for making the planet so hot, we clearly are the ones that are responsible for making it not hot. Because the planet didn't do this. The sun didn't do this. There is no external cosmic force doing this. It's our own work that's made it possible. Unfortunately, the caveat to this is that we tend to learn by experience. We don't like to read a book and say, yeah, I believe it, I'm gonna do it right now. Yes, mom, yes, mom, I'm gonna do it, yeah, okay, I'll do it. No, no, we wait until we do something like, no, dad, I promise, I'm not gonna go over the cliff. Oh, that looks so cool. You know, we test, we like to explore, we like to push our boundaries, right? There's actually a law about this. There's a human law about this. Vernon Sanders law says experience is a hard teacher. They give the test, he or she, well, experience gives the test first and the lesson afterward. <laughs> and that is how we're learning right now. How did we learn from Irene? Everything we're doing now in the town of Hartford, we did because we learned, all of Southern Vermont learned because of Irene, right? It was like from upstate New York, what we call a two by four off the back side of the head. The other thing though that's positive about this is once we do learn this, I am finding as a scientist the most effective solution is to share stories. And the more we can communicate them, repeat them correctly, not the fish story, the fish story, but the real fish story, not the exaggerated one. There's, there's so much going on on the planet we really don't need to exaggerate anymore. And that actually has another rule that's called Occam's razor. And that's all other things being equal. Simple is a better solution over complex. And that's where at a town level, I think, people can really make the difference because at the town level, we have to be simple. We don't have a lot of resources. We don't have zillions of dollars. We don't have a billion people. We have a few resources, a few people, a limited amount of time, and, and we're all not the sharpest pencil in the box. We just try our best, right? And we have a lot of puts to do it. So if we can do this, if we can realize that it's maybe not, if we can learn from stories instead of experience, then we don't win the Darwin Award. <laughs> and if we can do that, then we've got a chance. So I want to do, show two examples and then get to the movie, um, which we had made, on, but to get the background conditions. So for example, I've been experimenting. How bad are the sea ice conditions? I can pull up graphs and you go, oh my God, and the numbers and the fact that there are, you know, 10,000 times more lost cubes of air conditioner ice than there are people on the planet, just in the Arctic. We're not even talking about the two glaciers or the Antarctic. I can pull up graphs till I'm blue in the face, but this little guy is the one that got George Bush to sign the Endangered Species Act and people to actually say, oh my gosh, yes, the climate is changing, the polar bears are starving. When I was up there as a beginner in the 80s, this is what the ice looked like. Off the coast of Greenland, way off the coast of Greenland. And we had to deal with stuff like the polar bear eating my shovel, and, and it was very complicated. And the reason I was up there was because of the Cold War, and the military on the Russian, and then the Soviet and American side was trying to figure out how are they gonna do battle on this? How are they gonna fight? They call that terrain, and boots on the ground have to fight on this, and where are they gonna walk? And we went out there as scientists and we said, you can't, you're gonna freeze. I mean, just read Napoleon, just read Hitler, you know, forget it, it the war and peace. Don't go talk to Mr. Tolstoy, okay? I guarantee you, it's not gonna work. Diplomacy is your best bet because the stuff up there is gonna kill you, the cold kills. And that worked. And then the two little red phones were set up and communication worked and we solved the big problem back then. Today, this is the Greenland Sea. My PhD student who was up there in July. Um, this is right at the edge 
where the glaciers are now. This is not the sea ice way out, because there's no more sea ice way out. And this is what sea ice looks like. The bears are still there, in fact, you know, the cubs, and they're all cute and everything. And the moms are pretty furious if you go near them now, because they're like, don't come near my cubs. But that ice looks a lot different. It doesn't look rugged. It doesn't look furious. It looks like somebody left the door of the ice refrigerator freezer door open. It looks melted. Maybe we could go to war now. Uh, <laughs> actually, it's the terrorists we're worried about because they can travel across it very easily. When I was in Barrow in 2013 with the Naval Academy on some training exercises, you can see here's the, here's the Quonset huts we get to use from the old Navy research lab, and this is the, the houses and stuff that, and you can see this fog bank. Well, that's not a fog bank out there. That smoke is a lot like the smoke that comes off the river in the, in the fall. It's the heat pouring out of that river, and you know driving around here. The White River can block out a lot of territory because it's just venting that heat. That, that's part of that 300,000 BTUs that's trying to convert cool water down to work it towards turning it into ice. So, and you can see that when we were out there working on this, again, here we are working on the sea ice. This is in March. It doesn't look rugged anymore. You could put boots on the ground on this now because it's so smooth. There's that sea smoke out there, but now you can't because that sea smoke is indicating that there's just a ton of ice. The ice is so weak, even in February, even in March. You can see the way we're dressed. It's 30 below out there. Nobody is exposing skin. It is really cold, and that steam is pouring out of that ocean. And in fact, we have, we have data and reports and sensors now that are showing that, that moisture is pouring up six and seven kilometers into the atmosphere. The, the top of the troposphere is 10 kilometers. That's where the, um, the, top, that's where the, the aircraft fly above that at 30,000 feet. So they fly above the troposphere. This stuff is going 2 thirds, 3 quarters of the way up into the atmosphere in the Arctic and then moving southward. Plumes of moist, warm air in a place that used to be a flat terrain of ice. It's now becoming a new lake effect but the Arctic is a lot bigger than Lake Superior. So what I want to show you is where this is heading, and having grown up in upstate New York, this is what lake effect looks like if you're on Lake Ontario and you're in Buffalo, New York. That's how the, that's how the moisture rises, and it's pulling it out. This is at about near freezing. You can see there's snow on the ground, and the guys just to this side of the film are getting dumped with about a foot of snow and it's probably coming down at you know way more than an inch an hour. It's probably two, two inches an hour when it pours like this. So this is what's changing your snow patterns, and this is what's changing the winter patterns, and then that's mixing with what's in the tropics. So for the sake, I've got more movies like that, but the big thing is to get to the human contribution. How does this science match with what's going on with the humans? And again, that's what I'm trying to figure out. How do you tell a good story? So I've been working on a little scaling perspective. And I'm going to introduce you. This is Joe. And he's a really good worker. I mean, he's like the rest of us. He's a hard-working guy from a small town. And he stands about two meters tall. I'm going to use metric because it'll make the problem much easier to solve. We don't want to do this in feet and inches, I swear. Because this is Adam. And Adam is, Adam is two millimeters tall, OK? So he's like this. And what's neat with this is you can do a ratio to see how are we affecting the climate. So we're going to take Joe and we're going to make him this big. Um, he's still two meters tall, but we're going to compare him to the weather. And the weather is the troposphere and it's about 10 kilometers tall. And if you look at that, you'll see that Joe is two meters tall. The atmosphere where the weather is is 10,000 10, meters tall. So you've got a ratio of 2 to 10,000. And now we're going to take Adam. And Adam is 2 millimeters tall. And if you do the ratio of you know 2 millimeters to x equals 2 meters to 10,000, and you do the cross multiplying what you used to do in, in, in middle school, you will notice it's 10 meters. Adam only needs to be in something that's 10 meters tall have the same impact as Joe, who needs to be in something that's 10 kilometers. And 10 meters is about 30 feet. And 30 feet high for Adam 
is about this building. In fact, the volume is even about right. This very new building here, right? This building, if Adam was in here, he'd scale the same way. If Adam was walking around right now, he would scale the same as to the ceiling of, say, the third floor of this building. So he's in a world, and if this was his weather, and it was climate controlled, and it's got the whole system, and if Adam lived in this building, how would he be affecting it, right? Now, imagine there's seven billion atoms, Adam and in this building, right now. Brand new renovated, completely up to date, state of the art stuff. 10 billion, or seven billion, efficient, hardworking, eager, wanting to make a difference, raising a family, driving around in their cars, making industrial tunnels and pathways. Do you feel you can be comfortable in this room right now, given all the bulkheads and the wood and the, if it was a carpenter ant? <laughs> so, so that's my point. It scales. It's the number of people. There are seven billion of us on the planet, and we scale like an ant in this building. If there's one of us, no problem. If there's seven billion of us, and ants and humans have a lot of the similar colony attitude. They're very good, they care for their, their young and everything. But boy, when they get in your house and they start doing what you don't want them to do, you have to do something about it. And that's what the planet's doing. The planet's saying, wait, 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 you, you're making it way too hot here. I'm gonna have to make some storms try to blow you out and you know, cool you down. And our infrastructure is what will suffer. So basically, my point is, some of the shortest stories are the most profound. As we go forward, I think that's the real trick of going forward. How can we find those simple stories? How can we communicate those simple stories of our successes, of where we can do things in an energy efficient way so that we can make a difference effectively? And with that note, and of course some wonderful quotes from people like Lewis Monks to Richard Feynman, um, we really are responsible for every action we do. And everything we do will have both positive and negative consequences unless we follow through. And on that note, what I'd like to do is show the Irene film. Um, thank again uh, people like Vince. There's some literature in the back because I worked with them. I was responsible for writing the grant. They got the funding to do that. And we worked through it together. But Vince and um, Peter Malson, who's a climate educator from Hanover, and Teo Jagar, who are the filmmakers. We, we really worked as a, a, a very good team to make this happen. And I want to show the movie, and then I'm hoping we get a tiny bit of communication between this and HEC, or I just stimulate you enough so you blast HEC, the HEC workshop with a lot of questions. So I'm going to start the movie. When it began to rain on November 2nd, 1927, no one along the river had any idea nine inches of rain would fall in two days. Life in Vermont was about to change forever. The rain came down in torrents. It drummed so loudly on the roof we couldn't talk. Grandma made 27 loaves of bread that morning. When Grandpa came in for lunch, he poured a quart of water out of each boot. I've never seen the river rise so fast, he said. I think we'd best get up to the new house. For once, Grandma didn't argue. By the time she'd packed up, the water was up to the porch. I pushed the baby carriage with all those loaves of bread through the mud and rain up to the new house. Guess I built this place just in time, Grandpa said. Much has been written about the Vermont flood of 1927. 
This story is based on memories of an unfinished house that became an ark for a farming community on a river in northern Vermont. People and cows were stranded in trees and had to be rescued by rowboats. 33 people ended up living in that house after the flood. There were 200 chickens in the house, along with many other farm animals. One person arrived with dozens of loaves of bread. They even brought in a horse to help heat the house. Emergency officials say at least 22 people have died across eight states as a result of Hurricane Irene. The large storm spanned more than 500 miles. After making landfall in North Carolina Saturday, Hurricane Irene was downgraded first to a tropical storm, then to a post-tropical cyclone as it hit New York City, flooding waterfronts and low-lying areas. Up to 4 million people from North Carolina to Maine remain without electricity. Authorities say it could take more than a week to restore all the power. Meanwhile, in Vermont, tropical storm Irene dropped heavy rains late on Sunday, causing flash floods, forcing hundreds of evacuations, leaving 40 to 50,000 people without power. It's becoming Vermont's worst natural disaster since the Great Flood of 1927. At least one person has died in the storm. Hundreds of roads statewide are closed. Thousands of homes and businesses suffered serious damage from flooding. Vermont Governor Peter Shumlin says the flooding in Wyndham and Bennington counties is, quote, catastrophic. We turn right now to Governor Shumlin. Tell us what has happened to your state. Now, we've just been devastated. We uh, prepared for the worst, and frankly, we got the worst. Uh, just extraordinary amounts of rain, as much of it as an inch and a half uh, an hour. And in this little state, which is nothing but beautiful mountains feeding into valleys with small streams, uh, that just means strut, uh, flooding, loss of uh, property, houses, bridges, uh, infrastructure. So we've been uh, devastated, particularly in the southern and central parts of Vermont. Sunday morning, we were up to the fair. And my daughter called and said, it's raining hard down here, Papa. You should get home. So we came home. We had no, no idea what was going above us until we looked at that river and saw it that high and starting to back up from the brook back towards our garage. And that's when we knew we were in big trouble. I had to leave the house because the water was getting too high. The library sign came by and I jumped on it and went across from here to the other side so I could get out. My wife was standing all there yelling and screaming and howling and you know, but I made it. I, I gotta just stop right here for a second and, and throw this in. I am absolutely heartbroken at what I'm seeing right now coming in out of Vermont. I can't believe these pictures. I mean, this entire state is almost underwater. We knew the thing was coming, and like everybody, we were prepared for the wind event. We knew rain was coming too, but I don't think anyone heard 10 inches of rain. You know, I know I didn't hear 10 inches of rain. All of a sudden, uh, we saw the water turning very brown and it was coming rapidly. And then we knew that the Ottaquiche River was in trouble. We were open. And people are coming and going. You know, it's a Sunday. Um, we sold a lot of newspapers. Sunday was a very busy day for the locals. And I looked over, and uh, the water's coming up from the Ottaquiche on the right-hand side. I'd never seen that before. So I went back in, and I looked at everybody. I said, we're shutting down now. It's time to go. Shut off the equipment, lock the doors. We're leaving. And I swear, I was probably the last car that went over that bridge. People were being cautious, and uh, we decided, let's go check on the bridge, like everyone else. Three of us drove to the cover bridge in Queechee about 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. And the time the bridge was open, 
The water was very high. 20 minutes after we got there, maybe a half hour, the first propane tank started coming down. And sure enough, then we started seeing three, four, and then we lost count. These were large. These aren't little family tanks. These are 16 feet, 12 feet. And they were coming down in large numbers, bouncing off trees, and then going over the falls under the bridge. And the police came shortly thereafter and moved everyone off the bridge. But as we left the bridge, having been there maybe not much over a half hour, I looked back at the cement wall, and I noticed that since we'd been there, the water was up six or eight feet in 20 minutes. It was coming up fast. And the water started to go into the businesses, Simon Pierce, and then explosions of steam coming out everywhere, and walls started to go, siding peel, doors coming off the buildings. The devastation was evident. The smell of propane was evident everywhere. Propane like, uh, you know, like you didn't want to light a match. And I looked across at Simon Pierce, and I thought, did I just see what I thought? I saw the water rise. Never in my life have I seen water go up two or three feet in a matter of like two or three minutes while I was standing there. And I thought, this is what they mean by flash flooding. I mean, we have uh, bridges that I've been across dozens of times in my life in Queechee, Vermont, that are just being washed away. I can't believe what I'm seeing right now out of my home state. Tropical storm Irene made landfall and tracked up the western part of New England and between 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. it had only moved this distance. So a three hour time frame that it pretty much sat over the southern part of Vermont here. And we're talking about within anywhere between 30 minutes and, and, and three hours that a lot of that rainfall produced a lot of the record flash flooding that you saw in this southern part of Vermont. Irene, in many ways, was very uh, unusual. Relative to the 1927 flood, they both got on average of about 8 to 10 inches of precipitation. For Hurricane uh, Irene, that precipitation fell primarily within about a 12-hour window. The eye of the hurricane came up the Connecticut River Valley, and generally what we see for hurricanes is that uh, the greatest amount of precipitation and the highest intensity of precipitation occurs in the west and northwestern portion of the hurricane. One of the ways in which record flooding can occur is if a number of factors come together. The first one is, is primarily the amount of rainfall that fell, the duration or the time frame within which it fell. But also importantly is, what did the ground actually look like when that rain fell? So in the case of Irene, we had two batches of rainfall that pretty much primed the ground even before Irene hit, and that helped saturate the ground. And, and because that was already in place, the streams were already at or close to being bankful in terms of their conditions. And so when Irene came through, you had sort of like the convergence of all of these great factors in steep topography, which all helps to, again, concentrate that flow, make it move downstream really quicker than it would usually do. So when we think about what a landscape is capable of doing relative to the amount of precipitation that's falling, you might want to think of it as a sponge. At some point, that sponge is going to get saturated. As you keep pouring water out of the faucet onto that sponge, that water is ultimately going to start running off. And it's going to run off the landscape, and gravity takes over, of course. Gravity drives the bus and everything here, and gravity is going to take that water down the landscape into the river valley. And as you keep adding more water onto that sponge or onto that landscape, progressively more water is going to be routed into the stream channel, ultimately leading to a flood. Into it. It's right there. Oh my God! It was mind-boggling to see areas where you had a whole hillside going to the river because of that force. The, the outside bend of a river, with where the water velocity is the greatest. Oh my God! Somebody's bridge! Oh my God! To see some of the debris that were going down the river, uh, and what that was doing, and, and some of our bridges that got badly damaged because of that debris, and never thinking that we would have this kind of a problem.
And this also was quite unusual about uh, Hurricane Irene, and I would say to some extent dwarfing what happened that what happened with the 1927 flood. Uh, for Hurricane Irene, for many instances and many locations uh, throughout the state of Vermont, uh, we see upwards of about two or three feet of overbank sediment deposition. Uh, this is incredibly rare from a geologic and geomorphic uh, perspective. Generally, when we think about uh, overbank deposition across uh, broad valley systems, uh, that essentially, uh, even during large floods, this might be something on the order of a couple of inches to a half a foot uh, at most. Uh, for, for places like uh, South Royalton, across uh, the baseball field, which sends me deeply as a baseball fan, we saw upwards of about uh, two to three feet of sediment deposited broadly uh, across the floodplain of the White River. In many other locations, not just in the White River, but in other locations throughout central and southern uh, Vermont, we see upwards of about half a foot to a foot of overbank deposition related to Irene. Well, we jumped on the very next morning. I had three or four of my friends come with pumps, and we had generators, and we hooked up the pumps, and we started pumping. The church in town here, they were just absolutely tremendous. They, uh, they, they treated us very well. They were here, they were just like family. There's plenty of help out there, just ring the bell and they'll come. After the flood, for weeks, the heavy equipment was in the river. That is, was an additional problem in itself because with environmental regulations suspended for an extended period of time after the flood, a lot of damage was done that I don't think was necessary by the hand of man. Contributing to the next flood, Want one physical fact to understand this century, it's simply that warm air holds more water vapor than cold. The atmosphere is 5% wetter on average than it was 40 years ago. Even before Irene, it was clear that things were very different here. I I've always found the easiest public officials to talk about global warming with work in municipal departments of public works. They spent the last decade trading out small culverts for bigger ones because the old book, the old rule, rules of thumb, no longer apply. For us, Irene was the defining moment. It saw the greatest rainfall in the state's history, 11.23 inches recorded in Mendo. Now, if any place should have been able to cope with all that rain, it should have been Vermont. From now on, we need to know that Irene is what nature is capable of producing for us. When you talk about sea surface temperatures and the role of them in fueling um, hurricanes, hurricanes are an engine. The fuel that comes from the, the ocean is both in terms of the moisture as well as in terms of the, the actual energy itself. So as long as it's moving over warm waters, you need at least 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 25 degrees Celsius for that engine to be really pumping. So when you think about Irene and you think about Sandy and you think about the tracks that they, they took, both of them sort of moved over the Gulf Stream, which is by nature a warm current. In the case of, of Hurricane Irene, the, the Gulf Stream waters were anywhere between half a degree to about two degrees Celsius above the average values. In the case of, of Sandy, they were as much as, as four degrees or five degrees warmer than, than the average. So when you look at how do events taking place in the Arctic influence what's taking place in the middle latitudes where we live, 
There's been some work done on the Arctic amplification, which refers to the warming in the Arctic that is occurring faster than what is taking place in the middle latitudes. So you've got a, a difference in the rates of warming, and how does that affect what's taking place in other places besides the Arctic? Once you start changing conditions in, in the Arctic, be it warming, be it feedback loops, be it sea ice extent, be it temperatures, be it uh, methane release, all the different processes that you can see taking place in the Arctic, how does that move from a, a land surface affecting the atmosphere, and how does that atmosphere over the Arctic then start to affect what's taking place in the mid-latitudes in such a way that you see changes in jet stream flow, which will then lead to changes in your storm systems. And as you know, with weather patterns and the warming of the oceans and everything else, this is going to be more frequent. And we really have to take a hard look at how um, we permit and zone in different towns. It, it's a tough issue when people have farms that have been in the family for three, four hundred years and to see this kind of thing happen. One of the ways that we learn is is through stories. I mean, that, that's how human beings learn, by telling stories, by listening to stories, and what better way to go ask a family member or a community or a church member who's lived in the area for a long time, what do they remember about a particular event? They might even have diaries from their parents that recorded a particular event that they can go back and look at and then use that to connect with what we're seeing now. And so it's a great way to bring communities together in terms of matching up the past, the present, and the future in, in a way that enhances everybody because everybody's voice is then heard. We just could not believe the volume of water. I've seen rain, I've seen storms, but we were like, where is this water coming from? Some people say we've got flood control, but not, not to the extent that could really save a lot of houses and homes. We've really got to think about the high ground. I listen for the birds every morning because they make you happy. We didn't hear the birds for weeks after that. They went deeper into the woods to protect themselves and to make sure they had food. Water will go where water needs to go, and there's nothing you can do about it. Absolutely nothing. It's going to take out what it needs to take out. You know something? I keep kicking myself in the fanny. You don't cry over spilt milk. It's gone. Pick yourself up and go ahead. That's, that's what Vermont is about. You've got to say good night, Irene, and get rid of her and go on with your life. We are Vermonters. We don't ask for nothing. We don't get nothing. But we have a lot.